take their seats. Am I on? You can hear me? Yeah, it's on. Screen, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. I can project. You all know I can project. <laughs> so I'm not really worried about it, but I want to make sure that the people joining us on, on our live stream um, can hear us this morning. Good, good morning, and thank you for joining. My name is Rachel Stoll. I'm the managing director here at Stimson, and I direct our conventional defense program, which looks broadly at issues related to the international trade and conventional weapons. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today for one of my favorite annual events, um, and you'll hear why in just a few minutes. But I'm excited to share the stage today with three very important people and knowledgeable experts. I'm sort of against the word experts this week, though. Um, experts in this space. Um, Dr. Aude Florent from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, otherwise known as SIPRI, who is going to give us an update on the latest trends with regards to global arms transfers and military expenditures. To my left is Sarah Margon, the um, Washington Director of Human Rights Watch, and to her left is Andrew Miller, the Deputy Director for Policy for the Project on Middle East Democracy, you may know it as POMED. Um, who are going to help put the data that Ode presents in a larger geostrategic and political context. Uh, before I hand it over to Ode, I wanted to give a little background about what we're doing here today, why we're doing it. And it's, it's one of those events that allows those of us who work on the arms trade to geek out a little bit about the data and really dive deeply into what we're seeing um, around the world. But also for those of you who perhaps do not follow the arms trade quite as closely, an opportunity to really um, better understand the significance of the data that Aud is going to present and understand why we would even have an event to, to talk about this. So as you know, every year CIPRI releases um, data on both the trends in global arms transfers as well as on military spending. And we capture um, this, this data in order to really look at and better understand um, the shifting dynamics and trends that we're seeing in, in the arms trade and, and military spending over time. So CIPRI, if you don't know, is one of the most highly regarded sources of data. Um, they are widely quoted, so if this is the only thing you read on arms transfer data, um, you'll be okay, and there are copies of the, of the materials on the side. So we're gonna talk about two of these data sets today, the, the global arms transfers data um, set a military expenditure, expenditure database. And a lot of, if you haven't um, taken the time to go online and really investigate what's available, I encourage you to do so because these data sets go back to the 1950s for most countries. So we're not just getting a picture of what's happening today, but we can really look over time um, at what is happening. Um, and they are updated every year and have um, supplier and recipient data, the types of systems that have been um, exported and imported, and it helps um, to better understand how to track um, the, the trends that we're, that we're seeing. So each year we have this very event to, to talk about um, the, the findings and analysis and to underscore some of the potential implications of what that all means for what's happening in the world today, what's happening within our own government. Um, we do a DC launch because there are specific I'm going to say peculiarities about the United States and its system and its involvement in the arms trade that deserves um, more close examination. Um, you're going to hear, but it's not. I'm, not, I'm going to spoil the surprise a little bit. The United States remains the top weapons provider. Um, U.S. arms exports are growing um, significantly, nearly 30 percent over just the last five years, and military spending um, grew almost three percent in 2018 as compared to 2017. And a lot of this is due to changes in the Trump administration's policy. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, but I think putting that in a U.S. context is incredibly um, important to understanding uh, what our place in the world is and where we have some leverage um, in influencing what's happening in conflicts and in, um, in particular governments. So I'm really pleased that we continue to partner with CIPRI for this important event, and I want to turn it over to Ogg to give us a sample of this data and what we're, we're all here to hear. Oh, right. My button? Can you hear me properly? Great. Okay. I'm usually not a big tech person, even though I work on armaments. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you, Rachel and Jeff, uh, for organizing this again. It's always a pleasure to come to D.C. and uh, have this talk. Uh, 
I'm not necessarily here every year. I think last year was Peter's, but it's still, uh, it's still good that we can present our data to the U.S. audience uh, since you are just so big. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start actually, even though in chrono chronological order, we start with the arms transfers in March and then to the military expenditure in May. I'm going to switch it around. I think we should talk about the military expenditure trend first and see after that the arms transfers trend. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I just need to click, right? Yep. I got you. So um, military expenditure has been increasing steadily, mostly, uh, since the end of the Cold War. About 1998, you can see a start of an increase at the global level. Uh, one new thing we have included in this boring graph is the share of regions in the military expenditure for each year. So if you can see it properly with the color scheme, uh, you can see that uh, Middle East, Asia, and Oceania are pretty, pretty much um, responsible for some of the, from the, which is not surprising. Asia as a region has been increasing steadily since uh, China was included in the data sets with a consistent set of data, 1989, is the first year for which we actually had a full estimate consistent with our methodology and our definitions of Chinese military expenditure. Um, so yes, we are on a, an increasing trend that was somewhat stalled uh, following the financial crisis of 2008, but for which we saw the impacts uh, about three, four years later in military expenditure. Uh, but now it's growing again, and as, uh, as Rachel mentioned, I think a lot of it is due to the U.S. <laughs> Uh, not only is it the biggest structurally, the uh, anticipated budgets that have been mentioned tend to indicate that it'll continue to grow unless something happens. Um, so yes, the, the trend is upwards. Um, I work for a peace research institute. Of course, these kinds of trends are a little bit um, concerning for us. Uh, we need to understand what is going on. And we know that what is going on, that there are wars that are being waged, which are usually very expensive. I think the U.S. is pretty well uh, uh, aware of that fact. Um, there are also a lot of regional tensions that are mm, getting a little bit more severe in Asia. India, Pakistan has been a little bit uh, um, worrisome recently. Um, there, there are very much uh, in, uh, places where the... Um, Threat perception is very high. Australia, for instance, has been try is, is gearing up to buy more weapons because there's worry about Chinese submarines around the, the continent and so on. So all these will drive uh, military expenditure upwards, and this is what we've been saying. And for, for now, we have no indications that this would be curtailed in some way. Um, top 10 military <laughs> top 10 military spender. As, um, as Rachel says, not surprising, the big, big bottle <laughs> bubble is, mo is, uh, is about um, the U.S. And it's followed by China. Uh, in terms of uh, constant dollars, we always use constant dollars figure from last year. So this one is 17 USD constant. U.S. spending was 650 billion about. And China, which is second, 250 billion. So um, I, was in a, I was in a conference just before coming here about a new arms race. And I, I was a little bit an arms race. Who's in our race with whom exactly? Because the, it seems to me that the US is just so you know, far away from even the second one and ev even more the, the third one or everything, that you don't feel like, you feel like the race is already won, right? It's like, <laughs> you, you guys are, you, we're not gonna get there. And um, so it's, uh, it's been an interesting discussion in that context. Um, even though I think there are worrying trends in the military expenditure patterns of certain regions and countries, I think we should be careful about how we characterize it and uh, not, not put oil on the fire. I think it's a, is it a, also in English? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> put oil on the, on the. Um, we also see puzzling uh, decreases, such as the one for Saudi Arabia, minus 6.5% this year, for which we actually have not a lot of information on. Um, it seemed to us that Saudi Arabia is still a very much a very large importer of weapons, still is. 
It is heavily involved in an armed conflict in Yemen. It is at odds with a lot of its uh, neighbors. Um, and I so the, the number, the, the decrease that we have from the publicly available data that Saudi Arabia publishes mentions a decrease, but we have, un unfortunately, we don't really know what's behind that decrease. Uh, we're not even, we don't even know if there has actually been a decrease and there has been a typo in the budget, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, it's still, it's still um, Saudi Arabia is a very big uh, focus of the work that we're doing right now, Middle East as a general rule, since the, con the region's at war, basically. So it is, uh, it is also one of the largest importer that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, um, followed by the regular, regular suspects, Russia, South Korea, Japan, uh, and so on. Um, also, an, in an effort to relativize um, the Russian threat perception from the Western side of Europe or uh, Central European side of Europe, we decided to do this and show the, you know, the weight of NATO without US plus US. And like you have this little share that is Russia. Um, we have been, in, I don't think you, in the US you may not have had that kind of discussion, but when you're in Northern Europe, um, there are a lot of, um, discussions about Russians intentions with regards to Eastern and Central European country and Nordic country. For instance, Poland is very much, uh, uses very much the, the Russian threat as a, you know, to get, to, to, to get uh, closer to NATO, to get more US equipment and, uh, and imports and so on. And we try to put things into perspective uh, in terms of uh, the weight in military expenditure uh, compared to the Russian, uh, which by the way have been decreasing their military spending for the last two years. They're in between <laughs> military modernization program right now, but I've been told by a, a very good colleague that works in Moscow that they're starting a new one. So it'll go up again, I guess. <laughs> but this I think is important. It's part of the, our mandate to put things in perspective. Uh, there is concerns to have on what is going on there, but they need to be relativized to what's going on uh, with other regions and, and in other uh, situations. And then uh, we have put a more emphasis this year on the um, share of GDP, military expenditure and its share of GDP in the country. And what it highlighted, I know the map might not be clear, but what it highlights is that the countries that, you know, for which military expenditure in terms of terms of GDP are highest, are mostly all in the Middle East. And you have percentages that are not very economically healthy, 4%, 5%, 6 point something percent in one case. It's enormous for a country's GDP. Um, NATO is trying to get the 2%, uh, <laughs> and it's not really working that well right now. Um, but still, um, Usually countries at war tend to have higher GDP, uh, percentages of GDPs. So that wouldn't be such a surprise, but this has been going on for a while actually. Um, so yes, you can see that in the Middle East, um, there are structural issues, enduring issues in terms of military expenditure. One of which is the fact that we don't have figures for all of the countries. So we don't have a regional estimate. We stopped doing a regional estimate because there's too many holes. There's, a, a f there's a quite a few countries in the region that do not publish anything at all. One of which is the UAE, a big one. <laughs> Qatar, another big one. And the others, we actually don't know if they're big or not because we've never had any figures. So, so um, yes, um, this is even more problematic considering the fact that these countries are very hev heavily involved in different types of conflicts right now, armed conflicts, active armed conflicts, to which the US participate, but not just France, we've uh, apparently uh, discovered recently, um, which I was uh, happy because I kind of knew it. <laughs> so increases in military spending, enduring violent conflict, 
more and more tensions in, several, in pretty much all the regions, maybe except South America, but there's Venezuela. That's a little bit of a, we don't know what's gonna happen there yet, but um, it also leads to um, transfers, especially for countries that do not necessarily have military production capabilities nationally. So they tend to like, import their weapons for major arms producers, such as the US, France, UK, and so on. Um, as you can see here, the trend is also up. As a, as a note, you have to understand that for the arms transfers, we do not take year on year. We only look at five-year trenches. There's a reason behind that. Is, um, there is not necessarily transfers of large weapon systems every year. So if you look at year on year, you're gonna get a situation where you're gonna have big fluctuation. Let's say the UK has, this, has transferred uh, uh, two or three typhoon to X country, but the year after or the two years following that, they're producing the new ones, so they're not transferring anything. So we use a five-year average, and we compare trenches of five years in order to have a better understanding statistically of how, much of, how, how many weapons and how much have, have been transferred to different countries or regions in this fact. So there's an upward trend also in transfers, Again, for the, because of the same drivers I mentioned for military expenditure, basically war, tensions, and also modernization programs um, through imports of, of material. However, the trend is going up, but it's still not to the level that we, you, we observed during the Cold War. Not even close yet. Hopefully, it's not gonna go there either. <laughs> but yes. There is an, uh, again an upward trend, and again we should be con we should be uh, observant of that trend. Uh, we only count also for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with our methodology. We only take major weapon systems, so we do not cover small arms and light weapons, cluster munition, um, all these things that I think the Stimson and other really great outfits work on. <laughs> we only focus on the big stuff, apparently. Um, so. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the largest arms exporter are the U.S., which, by the way, by coincidence this year, the U.S. is both 36% largest exporter and 36% largest spender. It's, it really is a coincidence, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see, though, the hierarchy of the major exporter remains pretty much stable. Uh, U.S. obviously at the top, um, and you got Russia second, even though there's been decreases in spending, um, they're still exporting weapons to their main recipients. They have been struggling recently, uh, however, because of India. India is one of their main recipients of weapons, uh, one, quite a large one. Uh, but India has been, um, has been uh, having uh, financial issues and they delayed some of the orders that they had from Russia. So it, Russian, um, Russian export decreased mostly because of India and other similar types of situation in uh, recipient countries, which the U.S obviously doesn't have, since U.S. export uh, I grew by 29% uh, over a 10-year period. That's quite a lot. Um, so, and then you also have China. China is increasing very, very rapidly in terms of, uh, as in, in its role as an exporter. It's still a large importer, very much, uh, but you can see that that ratio is changing almost every, every two, three years. Um, they are developing their arms industry. Um, they're getting better at it. Um, they're pouring a lot, a lot of money in it, so eventually they'll get some more results. Uh, and they are actually becoming more and more uh, present on foreign markets. Whether or not they make their, you know, the, the, the capture for a long time, several markets, it remains to be seen, I think, at this stage. But uh, China is not the, the country that well, the country in terms of military capabilities. It's not the country it was 10 years ago. It's changed very, very rapidly uh, in terms of the military procurement, military production, uh, imports, exports, everything. Uh, as far as we can see, also, because some of it might be a little bit difficult to track. And then, of course, you have uh, other larger West European exporters. France, Germany, uh, to a certain extent, even though there are very much differences in the policies to transfers to certain countries, especially Saudi Arabia has been 
whether or not you would uh, agree to, to transfer a weapon to Saudi Arabia in the context of Yemen has created tensions between the member states. Uh, so France doesn't, I'm sorry to say, France doesn't give a fig <laughs> to whether they are sending weapons to whomever. Uh, UK is very much dependent on Saudi Arabia for its export, uh, especially Typhoon, Eurofighters, and Germany said, well, no, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> so, and also uh, the smaller countries, the Netherlands, have uh, fin the Finns, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of countries that have decided that they would not transfer as much as they can weapons to Saudi Arabia. So European defense, the, the dream of it seems still to be a bit stalled by <laughs> different normative positions with regards to sending weapons in regions in conflict, which I think is a good thing. It you know, allows a little bit of discussion about uh, what should be done at this stage, but it's still very much a national discussion right now. Largest importers, again, unsurprisingly, Saudi Arabia. Not only because of the fact that they've received a lot of weapons, some of which seem to be just staying there and not being used at all, but some of which are definitely are, but also because they've received um, very performing um, weapons, also anti-missile systems, uh, UAE the same. Um, so those are high value, very strategic, uh, important uh, types of equipment you wanna have if you're in a war. So that increases also the value of the weapons, but still remains the main recipient. Um, India pushed to the second place for the first time, I think, or the second time since we did it, because they, import, they, they want to develop an arms industry. They just can't do it, so they import and they try to do it that way. It, it's still not working. It's been 50 years ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Me. I am not, it's since the almost the independence. Uh, but somehow they just, like the South Korea um, took about 45 years to get an actual comprehensive arms industry that is pretty, perf you know, pretty good, uh, and it will continue to be good, and, but now they can export pretty much in every segment of production. While the Indians have been trying to do the same thing and so far have not managed, I don't think, anything of uh, concrete. But anyway, um, so <laughs> the, the, and the South Korean are now part of the, um, of the arms producing country and will probably decrease their role in the importing uh, more and more in the, in the next few years. And then just, this is the, the last slide and I'm probably again too, mo too long for that. <laughs> just to give an, an idea, by region, the three main um, export, exporter on the side and you can see with the thickness of the arrow which is the biggest, which I'm, we already know, but I think I thought it was a cool graph. A little bit complicated, but still a little bit cool. So in, uh, in a summary, yes, the trends are up. Um, I am not talking about the arms industry data that we do because it's last year, and it's, um, but it shows the same kinds of trends. Of course, if there are more military expenditure and there are more export, there's gonna be more arms sales for the industry that sells the, those weapons. Um, and of course, for us, these kinds of trends are not necessarily heralding um, good news, especially, again, the willingness of several of the Western countries to send weapons to countries in armed conflict where there's humanitarian crisis, where there's um, a lot of tensions already uh, that could provoke other kinds of con armed conflict, which we, we we can't, you know, which obviously is not something that we wish would happen. So thank you for your attention. Um, and any questions when Rachel says, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, She's like a boss. That. I get to decide when we ask questions. But I do, I, thank you, Aud. I think that's really helpful to, you know, get sort of a picture of what the numbers look like and what those numbers look like when you put them sort of on a trend line. And I think it's not a surprise that the trend is up. I don't think it's a surprise um, that the uh, that the race is so disproportionate, right? That the U.S. is so far out in front in terms of both spending and um, and exports. But I do think it is surprising if you just read sort of what comes out of the Trump administration in terms of like this threat from Russia and China that we have to stay ahead of. Um, otherwise, you know, our defense industry is going to 
fail, that um, our allies and partners aren't going to have the systems that they need. And so I want to take a few minutes um, and have a conversation with Sarah and Andrew that sort of puts this in a context of what this means in terms of policy, in terms of accountability, and in terms of what it means for people um, living through some of these conflicts or living in environments that are threatened um, and how this sort of affects people um, and the conflicts that they are that they're in. So I, I'm going to start with Andrew in terms of can you put this a little bit we sort of had all the data and and I'd started talking about the geopolitical strategic concerns that this raises but I'm wondering before we drill down to the US a little bit if you can put this into a context um, that, that sort of is relatable to a U.S. audience. Sure. I, I, mean, I think what is interesting is the shape of the international global political order that's emerging. And what we see is very different from the prior um, era, you know, prior to uh, unipolarity, where you had a bipolar uh, world structure. This is much more multipolar in nature. And you have the United States, and then some distance behind you have China, but then you have a slew of competitors that are spending over $10 billion per year. And, and this may, in the long durée, um, portend a, a very different type of, of international structure, very different rules for how you conduct business and pursue your interests. And you know, from a U.S. perspective, it's a little alarming, frankly, because we don't have that much experience operating multipolar orders. Our rise to global preeminence was very much a World War II phenomenon, so we've dealt with the bipolar era and we've dealt with an era of unipolarity. And uh, the multipolar era that existed prior to World War I was obviously very messy, and certain states excelled for periods of time in managing uh, the tensions and trends, uh, but the United States was very much a, um, a continental power, as it were, a North America continental power. And I think it will be a steep learning curve if we do enter that international order, how the United States can uh, pursue its interests, uh, how you deal with uh, you know, regional hegemons, how you deal with a situation where you may have preponderant power, but you don't have decisive power in that you can dictate your interests. And I, I think that's something actually for those who are practicing foreign policy, practicing international relations, we need to begin coping with because through bolstering the defense budget through arms exports, we can delay the reckoning, but it's eventually coming. And I really am concerned that we're not prepared to, to deal with that type of order. I just want to follow up on that because we heard a lot about the Middle East here and, and its dominance as, as a recipient, as a spender. And I'm wondering, given your background and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, can you talk about what this looks like for the Middle East and what um, you know, how the, the trends that, that uh, Aud mentioned sort of impact the region? Because it does create, right? We right. sort of know the arms race <laughs> theology here, and it, it sort of reinforces that, that cycle. Well, as was discussed in the presentation, more interesting arguably than the, uh, than the uh, total spending numbers was the percentage of GDP, yeah. which is isolated from the Middle East. And to some degree, Certain countries within the region could handle that because of their natural resource wealth. But those days are coming to a close. And uh, you know, we, just, we don't know what's happening with Saudi Arabia. You know, one potential explanation is they're depleting their foreign currency reserves. And they're dealing with an increasingly restive population that requires more government support, that requires payoffs in order to maintain uh, key essence. And, and, and to the extent that's true, that um, the, the economic potential or the economic uh, you know, wherewithal of these countries is declining, there's increasingly going to be tension between these inflated arms budgets, these inflated defense budgets, and the requirements of domestic political order. But based on what we're seeing, we, it doesn't appear that there's recognition that countries in the region appreciate those changes uh, and appreciate how it's going to increasingly um, reduce their freedom from maneuver. Uh, so I, I think that is certainly problematic. It's problematic from a perspective of political order and from internal stability. It's also problematic from a de developmental perspective because um, the Middle East remains highly underdeveloped. The Middle East continues to suffer from large youth populations and high unemployment. Uh, the money is not necessarily going into those sectors. It's going into the arms industry, which is particularly riven with 
corruption in that part of the world. Uh, so I don't think that augurs well for um, any return to stability in the region in the coming years. And I wonder, um, given what Aud said about certain countries changing their policies about arms sales to Saudi Arabia in the context of Yemen. So we saw the U.S. even had, we'll talk about the U.S. in a second, the U.S. had put some things on, on hold. We had several European countries that also had some sales on hold. Could that, could sort of the tide be changing in that people are looking at that region with a bit more um, scrutiny or? I think they have to look at the region with more scrutiny because it's become a more active uh, theater for combat. Uh, for decades, the Middle Eastern countries themselves were relatively passive, and they were prepared to uh, depend on the U.S. security guarantee, not just as a final resort, but as the first resort. If there was a problem, call uh, the local policeman, which was the United States, and they'll bail us out. Now we're seeing with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, for, unfortunately we don't have data for them, that they're increasingly <laughs> willing to undertake action independent of, of U.S. support, independent of um, US, um, a U.S. green light. And I do think that uh, that, I that inherently increases the risks. Um, of these weapons being misused or being used against the interests of the country that's providing them. Uh, so I, I think that's beginning to certainly trickle down with the U.S. policy process. I think the U.S. Congress is increasingly aware of those risks. Not clear that the, the, the White House um, is equally concerned about it. Uh, and, and I think we've seen some other, con there are concerns in the U.K. and the Netherlands and in Germany, less so in France, which seems to have adopted a fairly mercantilistic arms policy, uh, but, but you do see that spreading, and I think that is changing the calculus of countries because whether they want to or not, their publics are going to demand a greater degree of accountability mm -hmm. for how these weapons are used. And let, let's talk about the U.S., and you just talked about the, the discrepancy sort of in understanding between Congress and the White House, and I want to I turn to Sarah and talk about, you know, it is not surprising the U.S. is the number one arms exporter and military spender. It is been that way for a very, very long time. But something has changed, I would say, in the last couple of years with this, um, with the Trump administration and their perception of the arms trade, of what it's used for, yeah. and also um, how it sort of manages the arms trade. So I wonder if, you, for those who don't follow this as closely, if you could sort of brief us a little bit on how things have changed with regards to arms sales under the Trump administration in term, and what we're seeing in terms of arms transfer priorities, which to me sort of underlies the biggest shift. Something has changed. It's, it's a man sitting in the White House. <laughs> um, I think it's important before we talk about what's changed in the Trump administration to recall uh, that under the last administration, there was also an uptick in sales in a number of ways. The percentages were increasing steadily. We saw at Human Rights Watch a number of sales that gave us a lot of heartburn. I mean, let's be honest, the, the Saudi-led coalition conflict in Yemen began under the last administration. It was the Obama administration that started those sales, and it was only the last one after a lot of external pressure, the last sale that there was an agreement to put it on hold, as well as two other sales, one to Bahrain and one to Nigeria, mostly because of human rights conditions. So they also began after, gener uh, after decades of a ban, they, res they began to resume arms sales and military engagement with the Vietnamese. So there were a lot of countries all over the world that the last, the previous administration resumed that. In part, there was also an increase in partner security force uh, support and we saw this uptick as part of the way the Obama administration would pull back U.S. forces. So we saw an uptick in drones, which you know far more about than I do, really, but also an uptick in sort of security assistance and sales to a whole number of countries. I think the thing that was at least uh, comforting at some level was that there was also an understanding that you couldn't sell or provide weapons uh, without a consideration of political or geopolitical dynamics or the human rights conditions in a country. Now, there has always been a trade-off. We at Human Rights Watch are very accustomed to this kind of trade-off where national security and economic concerns, often Trump, no pun intended, the human rights concerns or the lack of accountability in any number of countries or with any number of governments. That, at the end of the last administration, did actually prevail. And so these three weapon sales that we were very, very concerned about were, were held back. We knew that there were pretty strong internal discussions that included components of, a human, of the human rights conditions and concerns about the government as well as their sort of corruption concerns. When it comes to foreign military sales, that is not a core component. When you have security assistance, the military units that you're working with have to be vetted, right? And if they don't pass muster uh, for human rights abuses, they don't get that kind of cooperation. But when it comes to sales, that is not an obligation. Uh, 
we felt some measure of confidence that those conversations were happening. And that is part of what has completely changed, as far as we can tell, under this administration. Not only are, are there very few, very few senior officials home would, who would actually bring to bear the analysis and understanding of human rights, human rights concerns and potential abuses by military forces in any number of countries, but there's also been a change in the conventional weapons policy. It was um, just over a year ago, right, mm -hmm. April 2018, mm -hmm. that basically made extremely clear that the priority was defense industry, economic uh, advancement, sell more, sell faster. And so, yes, there was some language about human rights and international humanitarian law that had to be upheld or met, but it was really at the bottom of the policy, and it was very clear what the priority was. If I'm not mistaken, another change was that defense contractors could also sell directly to foreign governments, which is a huge concern because that just sort of upends any potential oversight and transparency and, and basically circumvents the congressional role. And so I think those changes within this larger, um, I guess the best word to use is incoherent foreign policy of the Trump administration, mm -hmm. which has, if you can find some threads to pull on to, to, to sort of say this is the vision, I would say it's hardline, it's militaristic, it's transactional, and it's politicized in that it's not necessarily decision making for what's good for either the US on the national security side or considers the humans and the individuals in that country, but it's what's good for President Trump's political base here in the United States. And so that is a very different way of engaging in foreign policy. It's very erratic and it means that, yeah, sure, it's good to sell weapons to these countries. And so I think when you think about Saudi and the, uh, and the UAE when it comes uh, to the Yemen conflict, what's striking to me is that it's been over four years that that conflict has um, been going ongoing. The number of civilians killed, wounded, the humanitarian crisis is so significant. And so just to go back to this congressional piece, I think what has really generated interest is not the scale and scope and devastation in the country, but it is a merging of something that somehow is more relatable to many Americans, which is the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in a consulate, because many of us have gone to consulates where we can try to get a visa to travel to a foreign country, right? That's a normal thing. Or get some paperwork done, get your passport. That somehow tipped the balance in a way that has actually benefited the movement to stop the arms sales. But if that had not happened, I am not sure we would see this congressional action to stop arms sales in quite the same way and to stop the conflict. And so it makes you think a little bit about how do you engage Americans in a way that relates them to get them to engage Congress? Because right now, the White House and the State Department and frankly, the Pentagon, even without a, a confirmed, sec particularly without a confirmed Secretary of Defense, are really charging forward on an accelerated pace to sell weapons, walking hand in hand with the defense industry. And Congress is over here as, I think, at least for the next two years, kind of our only hope to slow that down. And we've seen movement, but it's not consistent that it's going to be across the board uh, a speed bump, if you will. No, I do want to come back to the congressional role. I mean, I think the word that you use, transactional, sort of the attitude of this administration to see arms sales as transactional, when in reality, you know, yes, you have this individual transaction, but the legacy and the impact yeah. of those weapons yeah. can last much longer than sort of the cash in hand. Um, so I think that sort of this missed opportunity to think about how arms sales can be utilized to achieve, which we hear all the time, to achieve foreign policy and national security objectives. So I wonder, Andrew, can you talk about a little bit how this administration is viewing arms sales, particularly to the Middle East, as a way to achieve these priorities because we're we're not as concerned about the conflict we're concerned about sort of the the transaction itself but also you know we keep every time you, if you read a um, an arms sale announcement it'll say like you know it supports mm -hmm. regional objectives furthers u.s national security they say that in every in every single one but in what way does this administration really view that as the as the case traditionally uh, there are three purposes or, or three stated rationales for arms sales. One of them is, is simply to support the domestic arms industry, to create jobs. Another is to build relationships with foreign countries. And the third is to build capacity, to make countries more effective in, in defending their own security, to relieve the burden on the United States. And, and I think 
all previous administrations, uh, at least in recent years, have uh, pursued all three of them to varying degrees. I do think under the Trump administration, you have seen a shift towards the, um, the arms sales argument as an economic um, uh, subsidy for the, the U.S. arms industry. And uh, you've also seen a, the rationale stated repeatedly that this investment in, in countries, these arms sales, are an investment in burden sharing. Uh, and uh, Trump has said this before, that we're selling country X, country Y, whether it's Israel, Saudi Arabia, all of these beautiful weapons. Therefore, the United States is no longer responsible for being the first on call. So th with these weapons, they should be able to take care of their own business. The interesting thing, though, with the Middle East is that while I agree Trump has a very transactional view of, of international relations, the Middle East is actually somewhat of an exception in certain respects, where with countries that are traditionally identified as our strategic partners and allies, NATO, the Europeans, he's increasingly relying on a transactional approach. With countries that are historically transactional, with Saudi Arabia, um, with the UAE, he seems to have almost a made a strategic bet on them. And you can see that most clearly in the Khashoggi affair, where you know, transactional, uh, the transaction works both ways. It's not just an opportunity, but when there are increased costs, you scale back. But you haven't seen that from the Trump administration. The cost of doing business with the Saudis has increased. And and uh, we haven't seen any corresponding um, lack of enthusiasm to continue investing in that relationship. And you know, partly, I think, due to his own psychology and his own affinity for some of these royal families uh, within the region, uh, he has made a major investment. And uh, you know, unlike a, a good businessman who would recognize that's a sunk cost and we're going to move on and cut our losses, they just keep throwing good, uh, good money after bad. Uh, but I will say that. It, we need to be even-handed in that while Trump has exacerbated some of these pathologies in the arms trade uh, business, these are long-standing issues. And one of the most galling things to me is that you don't have rigorous assessment processes to evaluate the degree to which foreign policy objectives have been met, whether it's bolster, bolstering the arms industry in the United States, whether it's building relationships, whether it's building capacity. And just based on a very anecdotal uh, cursory glance, there are good reasons to suspect we haven't achieved our objectives. In terms of capacity, with the exception of the UAE perhaps, you haven't seen a qualitative difference in the ability of regional states to conduct warfare, and certainly not to conduct warfare in a way that's consistent with human rights values and with international humanitarian law. Uh, in terms of building relationships, I, I always say this half in jest but half seriously, we have to remember that it was the Soviet trained and equipped Egyptian military that made peace with is Israel and that realigned to the United States. Arguably, it was the Soviet trained Egypt that was the best friend to the United States, more so than the, uh, the US trained and equipped uh, uh, Egypt, uh, which shows that there are tensions uh, in all of these arguments. And my major concern is that so much of our arms policy is a faith-based exercise. We put forward certain theories for what we're trying to achieve that on their face seem logical. They seem internally coherent, but the empirical record doesn't necessarily support them. And because there is no reliable mandatory process for evaluating the degree to which arms sales have actually met objectives, you have the continuation of these same policies, which may not be in U.S. interest, which in fact may be detrimental to U.S. interest. Uh, so uh, to the extent that Trump has done any good, perhaps it's that in illuminating and putting more of a spotlight on some of these problems, there will be greater interest in Congress, there will be greater interest uh, amongst advocacy groups to take a fundamentally different approach. And ultimately, I think that's what's needed. I think we need a, a different strategy for arms sales as part of an overall different strategy towards partnerships, particularly with countries in the Middle East. Yes, you often hear that, oh, we have to sell weapons in order to influence the behavior of those recipients. And there have been academic studies. I don't know if there's been any official DOD studies, certainly not one that I, that I know of. But there have been academic studies that say, actually, there are very few conditions in which arms sales can influence the foreign policy of a particular country. And there are, you know, to deal with single suppliers and all these other very academic indicators. Um, but nobody, I don't 
think, I mean, that study no. is at least 15 years old. I don't think anyone's done anything more no. recently because we look right. at arms sales in a different way. Did you? Yeah, I, I would just add that, and the only instances in which arms sales have been useful as sources of leverage are when you're prepared to take them away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. <laughs> we seem habitually incapable of doing that. And, and more to the point, when you look at these three rationales, building relationships, building capacity, uh, you know, gener uh, supporting U.S. economic development, they conflict with each other. If your real objective is simply to maximize profit, then you're going to sell weapons no matter what. But if your objective is to build capacity, you're going to put money where it's likely to get a good return in terms of capability. Can I, can I pick up on this point about maximizing profit? Because I think that's a pretty good way to define what's going on right now. If you think of it through that lens, what you're, what you're looking at is even in a world where it's not, I, I would say it's not just multipolarity where we're heading, but it's some measure of significant great power competition. Mm -hmm. And so the way in which the United States is going to engage under this president and this administration, whether it's two or six more years, is that we're looking at how do we move China and Russia? And which weapons can we sell to get other governments in our court. We've been here before as a nation, and it hasn't worked out well. And I think the question for me is if the goal is to push China and Russia away by selling more weapons, at what point do these other governments stand up and say, wait a second, we are not a tool for you to go after China and Russia and Iran and maybe India at some point too. We are here as our own independent actors, and we are turning to them because uh, we're not really sure where you are and what kind of partnership we have with you, but we actually want to align with you. In fact, our systems are aligned with you. It can, as far as I understand, and I am, you know, not the great um, interoperability analyst, but my understanding is the systems that have been built in many of these countries can't transfer overnight to join up with Chinese or Russian systems. It takes time, not to mention the training and use of the, indiv the individuals who are going to use all these systems. So this mentality that we have to sell more weapons because it's not only going to make us money, but because it's going to push China and Russia and others away is a little bit warped and very um, inflammatory in a sense. It justifies what you're doing in the near term, but it doesn't include those longer term consequences. What's actually good for the United States? What's good for Americans? To say nothing of the complete cavalier disregard for what actually happens to the individuals in these countries that are impacted by uh, U.S. weapons sales and the use of U.S. weapons. And that's what I want to pick up on. You mentioned um, Nigeria, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia as three examples of during the last administration were sort of the breaks were put on, yeah. there was some restraint. And that is a word, if you look actually at the new conventional arms transfer policy, the word restraint no longer appears. It appeared in the previous one that was only a few years old. But the word restraint never appears. Right. Um, there had been this restraint. What, what, you know, I don't know if those are the best concrete examples, but can you give us some concrete examples of what sort of has changed for individual countries, but what that means for people on the ground? Because I think that's the piece, you know, we can look at great, charts and, you know, really be like, wow, that's a really powerful image, but we sort of lose the humanity in all of this. Yeah. We're not talking about, you know, the trade in bananas or something. You know, we're talking about lethal weapons of war, which, you know, if, if we just traded them and they sat in a nice warehouse, I think we'd be having a different kind yeah. of conversation. Yeah. But these are weapons that are, are items that are being used to cause, in some cases, if you look at Yemen, you know, immeasurable human suffering. So can you, can you sort of take those three examples and maybe yeah. bring it down to them. I mean, I think it really depends where you are when you talk about what the impact is. In the case of Yemen, it's pretty direct. Human Rights Watch has found that, found that the U.S. was a party to the conflict and therefore likely complicit in the, in the alleged war crimes that we have found. So it's very direct. We've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, over 7,000 civilian casualties um, in Yemen, and that is a very low number. Those are the UN numbers, but that's what we've been able, you know, so far to account for. We're looking at millions and millions of people suffering uh, from humanitarian crisis and displacement, three million on famine. So the the day to day um, impact is tremendous, and we have found U.S. weapons at various bomb sites, and so the deaths, the 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 chaos, the horrific nature of some of these these indiscriminate attacks are so. I mean, for someone who works in the human rights field, I'm used to looking at and reading about horrible things, and it's sort of beyond the pale. I think on the national, so, so the human side of it is, the suffering is unbelievable. And the fact that it hasn't motivated, or didn't motivate, I should say, for so long, 
a question, uh, it, has, it didn't motivate the United States to cease selling or to restrict the sales or to use them as leverage for change uh, was astounding to me and that it hasn't, there's been absolutely no accountability for any of these indiscriminate attacks uh, despite what the Saudis would like you to think. Um, but there's also a national security implication, right, which is, which is equally as important. A couple of years ago, our Yemen researcher told me that she was seeing all over the walls in Yemen signs that said, stop the American war, stop the American war. And while the, it wasn't, I'm not talking about, you know, fighting against AQAP in southern, southern Yemen. I'm talking about U.S. contribution to the Saudi-led coalition conflict. And what, what it was known as was the American war. They knew the U.S. was refueling. They knew that the U.S. was providing the weapons. That has serious national security implications for the United States today, tomorrow, and down the road over the long term. And so it changes the mentality of how people think about what the role of the United States is. We are not a good actor. We are not a constructive or helpful actor. We are a bad actor here in the United States. And that gives me a lot of heartburn, a lot of upset, because not only have these people suffered immeasurable casualties, but they are also now incredibly and growing anti-American. Not everybody, but there is a much higher likelihood that that there will be significant anti-American sentiment when the US continues to provide these weapons. So that's that's one piece of it. I think in the case, um, of Bahrain, you know, the, the, it was less uh, civilian casualties and more a sense that the U.S. had abandoned a position pushing for political reform for many years. The U.S. had laid out very clearly, and at the end of the last administration, the U.S. had laid out, the Obama administration had laid out very clearly some changes that needed to happen in the run-up to elections in Bahrain, which would have included support for civil society, letting defenders out of jail, stopping some of the torture. In fact, there was an independent commission report in Bahrain that many of these uh, recommendations had initially come from. And none of this happened. And when the Trump administration resumed uh, the weapons sale without any change in, in uh, Bahrain, it said very clearly to the opposition, it said to the Shia community, it said to the civil society activists and human rights defenders who now are still in jail and likely to be there indefinitely, the U.S. is okay with the status quo. We don't expect reform. We don't need to see reform. We're very to ha- happy to have um, this militarized relationship with Bahrain and, and the, the, the status quo can continue. So we basically abandon you. That's the message that was sent. And so on the day-to-day, I think a lot of these opposition actors and civil society um, activists felt that they had been abandoned. And I hear this globally, actually, when it comes to U.S. support for civil society. This administration is so interested in selling weapons, in selling you know, military security cooperation, and in building that kind of relationship that they don't care about us anymore. And that has a, a real impact on morale and undermines their commitment to peaceful political engagement at the same time that many of these governments the U.S. is selling weapons to is also clamping down on that political space. And so it creates a a pretty um, heated dynamic, and the U.S. is playing a rather unhelpful role, to put it mildly. And can you just mention Nigeria? Because I don't want this to be just a a middle... I mean, the Middle East gives us plenty of conversation. Let's not... (laughs) But I think, you know, Africa is emerging. Yes. Um, If you look at the slides and the data, yeah, right. That's a, and that's a uh, customer base that the U.S. hasn't um, exploited uh, yet as much. And so, can you just mention Nigeria, and then I'll, I'll open to yeah. Questions. I mean, I think the thing with Nigeria is they have had one of the worst and most abusive militaries across the continent for decades. And the U.S. has always had a difficult try- time trying to engage and to find actors, whether it's for training or sales. So the, Boko Haram, the fight against Boko Haram in the northern part of the country has really given, had really given the administration a way to engage. There had been cleaned up units that the Nigerians had created, and there was the hope that the U.S. could engage with them. I think the problem was with the sale of these 12 super Takanos was that not only did the Nigerians not have the right training or know how to use these planes, but it might not actually have been the right tools or the right equipment to fight against Boko Haram. And there was a history, a long history, of serious corruption in the Air Force that put a pause, basically put the brakes on the sale, and there were very uh, unclear commitments to making change. And when the Trump administration came back in, he very quickly resumed this sale without any reform, um, any any progress on tangible reform, and he did so right in the middle of an election period. And so basically what he did was put his um, his cards, stacked his cards on one candidate and said, look, we're going to help this guy win because he's the one who's supporting 
uh, a stronger fight against Boko Haram. Now, Boko Haram is not really a threat, as far as we can tell, to the United States. You know, many members of Congress have tried to actually make the case, yes, it's a threat in some cases to U.S. allies. But this was a very significant sale for a government that has not really built the capacity to manage these kinds of planes. And it was going to take 12 to 18 months. And so by the time the planes actually got there, the question of whether or not Boko Haram was going to be in the place where the planes were needed and then what Nigeria would use them for was really unclear. And I think, you know, Nigeria is an important U.S. ally on the continent. It is the largest country. It is a significant player in West Africa and on many of the regional organizations. But the tone that was set was not, let's build up a relationship that encourages, you know, legitimate, free, fair elections, that encourages the proliferation of civil society actors to actually have a voice, that hopes to ensure progress in your security sector reform. Uh, and I should mention that the sale happened short, went through shortly after uh, the Nigerian military accidentally um, strafed a displaced person's camp. So there were indications that maybe they weren't going to really know what they were doing. And so there wasn't a commitment to push this forward. There was just an interest in getting the sale out the door. That sets the tone on a continent where there is a lot of interest um, in buying weapons and weapon systems and getting more security systems from the U.S. and where we have seen a real increase in uh, security force engagement, partner security force engagement for the United States. So it's definitely worth paying attention to, you know, whether that – sale actually ever lands remains unclear to me. A lot has to be created and built before it actually gets there. Um, but it was notable because it, the Nigerian military, many have said, on a continent of a lot of bad security forces was really one of the worst. So there's a lot we could continue to talk about. We haven't really touched enough on Congress. There's, but I want to give um, our audience a chance to ask questions as well. I'm going to ask if you could please um, identify yourself uh, before you and hold the mic like this. So we'll start here because the mic's closer, and then we'll go. <laughs> we'll go here. Uh, Greg Sanders, uh, Center for Strategic International Studies, and quick two-parter. Uh, so first, Aud, do you have any sense for the U.S. exports and the growth? How much of that was foreign military sales versus direct commercial sales, so from the government or otherwise? And I guess we'll throw out the second part just to keep things moving. How dependent do you think, for the panel, the importers are on U.S. sales and security cooperations for their ability to do independent operations and, I guess, the Yemen war? Like, if you cut off that alone, would that make a quick difference or would that only matter for the longer term? Thank you. Oh, yeah, and make sure you're yeah, turned yeah. on. Where's my, where's my <laughs> All right, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, in, unfortunately, we'd love to do, we do track some of the FMS, and the DCSs are much, much more difficult to, to, because they're not necessarily published uh, in some cases. So uh, sometimes we find them, but the full data of uh, both, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the resources at this time to be able to track all of this. But we do. Uh, since this is one of the reasons we do not give financial figures to our transfers, uh, it's an indicator uh, that is a kind of a composite between strategic uh, and cost and different types and you know technological thing um, that is not a va financial value at all. So we don't really know how much these weapons cost and how much they're sell sold for for recipient countries. We have had indication that, you know, depending on the countries, you're going to get different prices for the same types of weapons, but you don't necessarily know what the internal systems are, the software, all these kinds of things. So you have to have, if you want to do long-term series, which is the arms transfers one starts till the 1950s, uh, you need to have a consistent way to compare older weapons, uh, newer weapons over time, and what they can do. Uh, how their, their value in terms of strategic and economic terms. So FMS and VCS is something that we look at, but we feel that most of that data is not necessarily consistent. There are holes in there, especially in VCS. So for now, we're receiving them. We're just looking at it, but we're not including it in the work we do directly. And we should ask Congress to go back to mandating that mm -hmm. both the um, direct commercial sales and foreign military sales, either through the historical factbook yeah. that DISCA put out, puts out or the 655 report, is no longer aggregated. Mm. If we could actually see, you know, what is it that is being sold to what country, that would be really helpful instead of having just 
a category from the U.S. munitions list, which while sort of um, indicative of what kinds of things, it's not the specificity, right. which then doesn't allow you to figure out what the what the values might be. And I'll turn to you too for the. Uh, I just wanted to add also that we do we do not we only count deliveries of weapons. So and we have to have a confirmation by at least three sources that the system is there, in order to say it's there. <laughs> so we don't necessarily look at contracts. Uh, contracts change over time. There might, uh, you can change a government that reduces or increases the number of units that have been ordered. A lot of things can happen during the life of a contract. So it has to be take, uh, taken into granted that part of the arms transfer database may be a little bit conservative. Uh, if we don't have confirmation of some of the deliveries, we're not including them until we get the confirmation. Um, so, as a warning. <laughs> and deliveries for, just for those who don't, deliveries oh, sorry. go over more than one year. So yes. you can have a contract, but maybe you deliver three the first year and five the next year. So the, the data, it's not, it's not apples to no. even oranges. It's maybe like avocados or something. <laughs> I think that's still a fridge. It's still a fridge. <laughs> uh, something without a seed. I don't know. Something else. <laughs> Can't say an eggplant either. Yeah. Can, can you repeat your question? Yeah. Uh, the second question? I can you use the, can you use the mic? Yeah. How dependent do you think, say, so as mentioned with Saudi Arabia, you're yeah. doing more independent operations. How dependent are they in the short term on, on these arms sales. exports and security cooperation? To so. so I can, I mean, we, so Raytheon is one of the, one of the main, main sellers uh, to, to the Saudi-led coalition. And when we actually looked at the, the percentage of sales to this, to those coalition countries, uh, it was very small. And so they would not lose that much of their annual income if they ceased to sell to the Saudi-led coalition. It doesn't mean other companies wouldn't try to come in and fill that gap. But there is something to be said when you look at the global percentage. So I want to say 6% of their global um, sales were to Saudi, but that may not be right. I don't actually remember the number. You may know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, but, but my point being is that Somehow in the media and in sort of the conversation about the U U.S. defense industry selling to Saudi, you might get the sense that it's like 75% of their annual sales, and without that contract, they're going to you know, go under, and hundreds of thousands of Americans are going to lose their jobs, and it would totally devastate the community. That's not the case. Um, can I just say that the, the, the main customer of arms in the U.S. arms industry is the U.S. DOD by far. Um, and also, uh, there's a lot of military aid coming from the U.S., so basically a lot of those weapons are given yes. to a country yes. for free um, with aid, with, uh, so, yeah, with assistance for maintenance and, and training and all these things, which is actually going on right now in the yeah. Middle East and in Africa yeah. and in Egypt and so on. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to have an actual idea of how much the companies are making from um, foreign military sales and direct commercial sales. Um, it's very, I mean, we've had, we've tried, uh, we've had a, a request to do that work some, uh, some about two years ago. Very little transparency. <laughs> some of it is presented on the, in the annual report or on the website or in different public reports. It's very, very patchy. For instance, Boeing shows a lot of aircraft and big systems, but nothing on the bombs, ammunition, ordnance, mm -hmm. nothing. Although they are big, uh, they're bombs producers. So they're missiles, not missiles, but still. Uh, well, maybe uh, I'm not exactly sure, but you can see that they, they choose what they want to show. Yeah. Uh, and they don't necessarily disclose some of the production that they make, even though they do actually participate. And here's just another, I was just going to say quickly one, a little tidbit is that if you agree to, this is one of my favorite Washington Insider Beltway pieces of information, if you agree as a foreign government to participate in the international military education training program, you get a discount on your weapons sales. <laughs> so, you know, certain countries maybe don't need that discount. So it is, I, I flip it just to talk about, because that obviously impacts the cost of, of what uh, governments are paying and what companies are making. But it is a little trick because in theory you're getting trained on how to use what you need to. You're getting, you know, they're giving you the laws of war training. It's a box checking exercise that on the other side when it comes to the battlefield often has no accountability. So impunity can still reign supreme, but it does give you a discount on your weapon sales.
Were you asking about the impact on the U.S. arms industry or the impact on the operations of the countries? Actually, the latter, but I'm very interested in the former. Okay. <laughs> to, to speak to the latter then, as a general principle, the Saudis are more dependent than the Emiratis are for day-to-day -day kinetic operations. Uh, and, and the degree of dependence is sector or service specific. I think the, the Saudi sector or the Saudi service that's most dependent on continued support from the United States is the Air Force. Mm. If we really wanted to, if we completely cut off sustainment maintenance to the Saudi Air Force, a large percentage of their fleet would be grounded within, within um, months, if not weeks. Uh, because they don't do ma they don't know how to do maintenance, and this is one of the the flip side of the lack of professionalism. It's not just that they can't identify the right targets and don't adhere to uh, the law of armed conflict. It's also that they don't do the 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 dirty gritty business of maintaining their their operations. Uh, so if the United States truly wanted to turn the screws on the Saudis and prevent them from conducting certain types of operations, we could cut off those contracts. We could suspend those contracts. That hasn't taken place. And uh, to return to a point you mentioned, Sarah, about the interoperability, which reinforces the dependence. The analogy I use, and this may not be comprehensible to the youngest in the audience, but there was a period of time in which Microsoft and Apple did not communicate with each other. You couldn't run Microsoft programming on Apple computers. That's what it's like for military hardware. You can't just overnight decide to use you, um, so, uh, Russian software on American equipment or vice versa. It doesn't work. You can create workarounds. You can create uh, syntheses. But it's very time consuming and it's very expensive. So that's one of the reasons why threats that these countries overnight will turn to Moscow or turn to Beijing are somewhat incredible or somewhat idle because uh, they can do that, but it's not without cost. Thank you. Uh, Omar Nidawi, Middle East and Security Analyst. Uh, a question and a comment, if I may. Uh, hearing the excellent remarks about the impact of unrestrained military sales to, to countries in the Middle East, usually autocracies, can only remind one of, of the situation back in, in the 70s between the Nixon administration and Iran and look where that got us and how it, instead of creating a pillar of security in the Middle East, it actually uh, precipitated the conditions that led to the demise of the Shah's regime and the, basically the disaster of the Iranian Revolution, everything that came after that. Um, so the trends are very concerning, I think, when, when we look at the Middle East today. A uh, question on the NATO-Russia uh, balance of, of, of spending. And looking at the data, it looks like the European side of NATO is outspending Russia five to one. Uh, now, on face value, that looks like, you know, NATO and Europe is in good shape. My question is, the fact that that five to one is spent by over a dozen countries, does it amplify or dilute the, you know, this numerical superiority, so to speak? And if so, by how much? Does it ex amplify the utility of that spending or does it uh, weaken it? This is a very hard question to answer. Unfortunately, as well, as you know, the European Defense Project is, uh, is still stalling. Um, there are talks still, again, at the EU level. That I don't know if you're aware of the European, uh, the new fund that the European Union has put in order to get more cooperation between industry on major arms programs. This has been tried before. <laughs> again, it's not new in Europe. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, you have um, sometimes of a bit of a, um, uh, I don't know, psychotic approach to this. I want to do, you know, I want to do, I want to cooperate as long as my arms industry are going to do this. The France is very much like that. Um, Germany is a bit different on that front, but it's still also very much uh, national centered. All the efforts that have been made to get Europe as a either a market or a supplier, a combined concentration of capabilities within very few companies in different countries. Nobody wants to let go of any of the capabilities that they have at all. Nobody, none, none of those countries want to. Um, so what they do is that they, they, they go to the US and open major subsidiaries such as Leonardo, such as BAE, which actually 50% of its revenue comes from the US, by the way, so it's quite a big thing. Um, so no, actually there is uh, some, if you want to call it like that, waste in a way. 
since there's a lot of different platforms in Europe, especially if you look at combat aircraft, you have the Typhoon, you have the, the, the Rafale, you have um, the Eurofighter, you, oh no, that's the Typhoon, sorry. You have, the, and you have a bunch of different air, helicopters, aircraft, ships, submarines. Um, so yes, of course, there's, there's definitely waste in a way, if you want to look at it like that. Um, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. The new fund is going to try again to do that. I guess it's going to depend how this, uh, these programs will be supervised by the European Union or by the authorities there. I am honestly, personally, not particularly optimistic that it's going to lead anywhere. Um, there's lots of tensions also right now within Western European countries about how to maintain the military capabilities in the regions. Because uh, the new generation of weapons that's coming, a lot of these countries can't afford it right now, to be very honest. Um, so it's going to be very, very challenging. So we'll see what that comes out. I hope I answered your question. Well, here. And then you can just hand the mic and I'll just move down the row. Uh, Paul Kavika Martin with Peace Action. Uh, thanks, Rachel and Cipri, for doing this every year. It's super helpful to us and the rest of the panelists for good analysts. Um, uh, two questions. One, uh, how do you look at defining military spending? It's always kind of a tough thing to figure out what to include and not to include. So like here in the States, are you including cost of debt uh, for some of the spending that we have, uh, veterans' costs, et cetera? Um, how do you define that for the rest of the of the rest of the countries. On the second question, and especially for the other panelists, is the cost of prevention. So some will argue that we're doing uh, these, this kind of spending for projecting military force, or others would say to defend against military force. But what about preventing conflicts in the first place and uh, comparing these costs to things like uh, development, uh, aid, diplomatic tools, um, and which show you can actually prevent conflicts or prevent violent extremism in the first place. Thanks. Do you, you want to yeah, start? Okay. With the, we the have data a, and then we'll <laughs> down. We have a very clear definition that is online on our sources and method uh, page. We have a uh, disaggregation of different categories, of course, military personnel, anything that is, a, in, is in the budget line. But we also include paramilitaries, pensions, for instance. Uh, paramilitaries are like the French Gendarmerie or the Italians Carabinieri. Uh, we are currently um, considering the possibility of looking at the Coast Guard here. Uh, it, it is not included in our uh, estimate, but uh, we think that a significant share of the Coast Guard is pretty militarized to some extent. We need to dig into this. We need to investigate more before we do anything. But we're looking at it. Um, but you're going to find there the, the most of the, the components that you would find in a, in a regular budget, plus some items that we have added, such as paramilitaries that are not included in the Department of Defense. Or uh, like, for instance, in France, Gendarmerie from the Interior Ministry is included in our estimate, which makes it much more higher than the one the French uh, publishes officially. We have this discussion every year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't like it. But for us, it is, for instance, including paramilitary forces. The gendarmes, the French gendarmes, are actually deployed in several regions in military operations. For us, this is military spending. They're not doing uh, security anything, or they're not doing development. They're there to fight um, in Central Europe, some of Eastern Europe, and in North Africa, especially now. So yes. The, um, we're always looking to improve our definition. We are, again, looking at the Coast Guard. There are other things that we've been tracking that we are wondering if we should include or exclude. But uh, for now, the, um, this is basically what we cover. Um, prevention. I mean, yes, of course. Prevention is always better. Ostensibly, it's a lot cheaper. It's always really hard to prove, right? We've been saying that for at least 20 years in this town, at least. I think what we see coming out of the White House now is that prevention is not diplomacy and you know adherence to the rule of law and development. Prevention is arming our friends and allies to the teeth and hoping that they align with us while we're doing that. 
the problem is those friends are not Sweden and Norway, right? In some cases, those, those friends are pretty nasty, bad, autocratic actors who have their own ideas and are not always willing to do what the United States wants them to do, even as, as the, the White House continues to arm them to the teeth. So I think there's the executive branch perspective on that, and then there's the congressional perspective, which is, yes, development and diplomacy is still really important. We need to provide adequate funds. They need to be doing that job. You've got, I'm blanking on the name of the bill, but the um, f uh, prevention, Global Fragility and Prevention Bill, right, which Congress has really been moving on. And it's, in some sense, not a sexy bill. It's really infrastructure focused, but it's so fundamentally important to making this point uh, just the foundation sort of of how how Congress pushes forward on a lot of these issues, and ultimately, I would assume injecting that into the next administration and potentially even the presidential campaign that 's hard you know this is a crisis run town, so people talk about conflict and crises, which inevitably has much more to do with picking up the mess and cleaning it up as opposed to preventing it. But I mean, you know as well as we do that there's a huge community now working on prevention that didn't exist in this coherent way even 10 or 15 years ago. And there have been a lot of gains. I mean, I'm not sure it's resonating with the current administration in any way, shape, or form at a senior or political level since they are clearly willing and able with a 33% uptick in arms sales from 2017 to 2018 to keep arming everybody you know, to, to the best of their abilities. I mean, I think it's irrational not just from an economic perspective, but also from a decision-making perspective. Uh, once you've allowed a situation to reach the point where the decision is between the use of force and not the use of force, you have limited the executive's freedom for maneuver. You've eliminated their freedom of choice. If you keep diplomatic economic development solutions on the table, that provides for a fuller array of choices and the hope that you can reach your satisfaction to a greater extent. And, and I think part of our, our imperfect record in the Middle East um, over the, is the fact that we do wait too long. We wait to, so long that the choices that do exist are imperfect. Uh, that's not to say that there always is a perfect solution at an earlier point, but we don't explore that option. We've foregone it because we've, uh, or forewent it because we um, aren't willing to invest in uh, prevention. We aren't willing to consider uh, other ways of resolving problems. And you know, as Sarah was just mentioning, you know, Trump seems fixated on the least costly of uh, the U.S. foreign policy tools. You freeze a couple hundred million dollars in, 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 uh, in economic and development assistance to Syria. Well, how much money has the air campaign cost? And we need to reduce the budget, so we're going to attack uh, the, the Section 150 account. That's less than 10% of the defense budget. It's just, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's kabuki theater, I think, where they're pretending to be budget conscious. They're, depending, they're de pretending to actually care about maintaining some type of, you know, minimal deficit, but they're only focusing on th those things that are uh, tertiary at best, not even secondary to the broader problem. And I think, I mean, this whole other panel, we'll do this whole another night, another day, but um, sort of the militarization of the dip diplomatic mm -hmm. options as well, right? That the State Department mm -hmm. has really ceded sort of basic diplomatic and development assistance to DOD and to the military. And so those lines have been blurred so much that even it, when we're talking about prevention, yeah. like by whom, like who's going to do this now? Because for the last decade or so, we've given that responsibility to our military to you know, figure out how to distribute. We had a great panel up here once talking about distribution of water in, in an African country. And it wasn't diplomats or aid, um, and development agencies that were doing it, it was the Pentagon was training the military how to do water distribution in terms of, an, of a, a food and water crisis, right? Like we, we just don't have the tools and the resources dedicated to a non-military solution in many cases. Actually, I'm gonna disagree with you. We do have the tools. We, have the, we, are we just don't use them. them. We, we disregard them and we don't use them. And we don't use them. Well said. Uh, we're gonna go to Jeff quickly. If, why don't we take, We'll go Jeff, and then this woman here, and then Joel, and we'll just take them three because I'm cognizant. Okay, I'll look real quickly, but I also want to thank everyone for doing this today. Um, Odd, I wonder as you sit from not inside the United States, whether you see the United States as a driver of other countries' behavior. Is their engagement in the arms trade and military spending limiting or encouraging 
an expansion of what countries are doing. And you know, whether you want to comment on Trump's decision 10 days ago to say he wants the U.S. to unsign the arms trade treaty, whether that will impact on how the arms trade works. And I'll ask that question of the other panelists, too, what they think of that. Um, the other panelists, my question is, and Sarah made an interesting point, that the Khashoggi murder made this personal for Americans, whether there is still, I think, a lot more work to be done to make this topic relevant at a personal level to Americans, what advice you'd have on that, and whether you're seeing any of the presidential candidates taking that up in some way, or if they were, how you would want them to take it up. All right, well, quickly, if we can pass the mic to this woman in the pink dress. Well, no, I'm going to take all three questions uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, Can you introduce ex Excellent uh, discussion um, here. Uh, what are you guys? Uh, what What can we do? I think in, as a society here, we're allowing Congress and lawmakers to cede their power to the executive branch and, in essence, intelligence communities when it comes to FMS sales and direct sales. And I think, you know, the defense contractors. I mean, it's you know, we live in a capitalist country. Obviously, they've outsmarted Congress people by throwing manufacturing plants in their districts, so now they're not going to vote on this. Uh, what can we do to get this out there to, to highlight to the American public that, you know, we're basically creating war around the world and we're not really doing anything about it and we're allowing people who are in bureaucracies to guide foreign policy? Can you identify yourself? Oh, Kimberly Dvorak at the Committee for uh, Responsible Foreign Policy. Great, thanks. I just want to take one more. Yeah, six minutes to Joel Johnson <laughs> uh, spent probably 25 years at, at this beat at AIA, Aerospace Industries Association, ran international, and I've been doing consulting ever since in the same sandbox. Um, just a couple of, th there would be many things I could talk about, but historical context a little bit. Post World War II, we in the defense industry could generally say up until about three years ago, most of the weapon sales that we made were never used against the neighbors. And in fact, mm -hmm. if you go back to you ha when the Russians were supplying Egypt, we were supplying Israel, there were three Arab-Israeli wars. When we supplied both of them and did the uh, peace accords and bribed Egypt with a billion dollars a year in military assistance, <laughs> you didn't have any Egypt and et cetera. Same with, uh, you can make the same argument with Greece, Turkey, the same argument uh, with Pakistan, mm -hmm. India. We were the ones, because we had influence on both sides of the military, we could keep things from happening. I think what has changed remarkably in Yemen is the first time Congress has had to deal with seeing U.S. weapons used against people. Just don't have that experience. Mm. We succeeded marvelously in supplying weapons and relationships that kept wars from happening. And, and we don't have a historical context in which to put Yemen. I mean, even Iran was a complete screw up, but the stuff was never used against us. The F-14s never flew against anybody. They're the most expensive observation planes of the world because we cut off their weapons. So they don't have anything to drop out of an F-14. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the fact is we don't have a context. And I think that's why the Congress is flailing around right now mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to do about something that we've never had to deal with in 30 years. Um, the, the only other comment, I guess quick comment, that, that uh, you know, the Trump administration got, don't get me started, but, but it, you do have to note that it was Obama administration was the first time that noted in their conventional arms transfer policy that industrial base was a consideration in arms sales. It had never been in any presidential conventional arms transfer policy from Reagan on. So, I mean, there's been a gradual change in the way mm -hmm. things work. Um, well, it's mentioned in the 90s, in Clinton's 95 policy, it, it puts um, economic considerations and, and the salient. Okay. Yeah. Clinton had the first, I think, industrial base, and Obama had the first mention of alternate sources. Yeah. Because the State Department was telling, we don't care if they could buy it from someone else, that's irrelevant. We're only looking at the foreign policy implications. Right. So yeah, the those both changed under time. previous mm -hmm. Democratic administrations. Mm -hmm. This guy just got rid of everything else except the industrial base, as near as one can tell. And again, it's worth noting that, I mean, yes, this stuff is important, but the big market for the U.S. is defense contractors is sure. the U.S. Pentagon. Exactly. <laughs> all right, I want to give everyone just a last sort of word to try and answer all of those questions <laughs> all at once. So we'll start here and just move down the line. All right, about the ATT, um, well, I think it's, it's a pretty 
bad signal that the U.S. is sending to other uh, signatories of the ATT. Al already a lot of the countries are not necessarily really complying to the to the ATT, even though they, they ratified it. So if the U.S. just unsigns it, I don't know if uh, that means anything in the diplomatic area, but it's also a sign that you can basically keep, get on and off the, 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 the commitments that you've made to better monitoring of the transfers that your country does or other countries. So I'm not sure it's a, well, obviously, from my perspective, it, it doesn't look very uh, positive. It's not a very positive move. I can't remember your other question. Sorry. I should have written it down. Um, so I'll leave, uh, I'll leave the other um, I mean, I, walking away from the ATT on the basis of, you know, unsound and false talking points that have been promoted for the last 15 years is ridiculous to me. It's a political move. The Cong Congress, the Senate was never going to ratify it. Sure, like, go ahead, make a big deal out of it. It's ridiculous. It sends a bad signal. It's really unfortunate given the negotiations that went on to get us there. And it's part of this trend of the U.S. walking away from multilateral entities to promote strength and sovereignty over anything else. And that's exactly what I would expect out of the White House. But I think it's a, it's a shame at the same time. I don't know if this administration deserves to be part of an arms trade treaty, given where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my first point. They're more predatory than, than protectionist, right? Uh, that's my first point. The second point is, um, on your point about U.S. weapons on a, on a population, I think Iraq and Afghanistan would also qualify as two conflicts where U.S. defense equipment was used on an other side that didn't have quite the same uh, level of arming and weaponry. I think Afghanistan, some of the, they may have gotten there over time, and certainly, you know, in Iraq, they certainly took many of the U.S. weapons that were there. But I think we have seen since 2003 at least. Uh, an explosion of U.S. weapons of all kinds being used against populations, sometimes by the U.S., sometimes by others, in a manner that has been disproportionate both in terms of what the other side can, can re how the other side can respond, but also disproportionate in terms many times of the attacks that uh, are sometimes indiscriminate, sometimes reckless, sometimes potentially war crimes, sometimes just an oops, a mistake. So I'm not sure I would totally agree, although I think in Yemen it has been particularly egregious. That said, maybe in 2006 I would have said the same thing about Iraq. And I go back to 1990 Iraq. I mean, that was a big surprise to see all the U.S. weapons used against our Kuwaiti allies and sort of all of the Western countries yeah. having this oh crap moment of all these weapons that they had been se selling. And that's what led to sort of a growth in transparency and more accountability for, for arms sales. But I'm really cognizant of the time. So. Okay, very, very quickly, <laughs> uh, on Khashoggi and, and how to make it person more personal, mm -hmm. I think politicians need to do a better job. And there's no reason they can't. This is what they do. They tell stories. And I'll, I'll give you one quick example. April Corley, the American woman who was badly injured in the Sinai when the Egyptians used U.S.-provided Apache helicopters to attack a Mexican tourist convoy. Uh, that's a story that should be told. That's a story they should seize on. It makes the assistance relationship with Egypt, uh, it puts it into terms that are comprehensible to everyone. In terms of creating a... Uh, in, in terms of you know creating a, a different approach around the world and trying to check this you know, militarization, part of the challenge is in executive legislative relations, and we have a major problem in the Supreme Court. I mean, at the most fundamental level, if the if the the going interpretation is that the executive is unbound, is Prometheus, um, you're going to have a president get away with a lot. We were fortunate that we had a president previously who, while he made mistakes, was more conscious of the precedents he was setting. Now we have a president who's willing to violate norms, and you've had very predictable consequences. Unless you have a judiciary and a legislature that are willing willing to check and willing to work together, it becomes very difficult to check the influence uh, of the of the president of the executive branch and then finally on inf influence we do have influence with arms sales our problem is we don't use it we just don't use it we tie our hands behind our back and we're unwilling and and with you know Egypt and Israel the Egyptians know we'll cut them off the first encounter skirmish with the, they're, they're done and uh, unfortunately that has been the case with internal conflict they can uh, attack a tourist convoy. They can attack. Um, they can use disproportionate force in the Sinai. We're not prepared to impose meaningful consequences. That's just one example. So that's a hurdle that has to be overcome. Maybe we're moving in a direction where there's greater willingness to pull the trigger, but we've been almost habitually incapable of doing it over the last several decades. 
So I think what this last sort of flurry um, <laughs> has shown us is there's a lot still to talk about. And I hope that this event sort of made clear that we need to dig beyond sort of the headline and really look at what is the context of what is happening with the particular sales um, in these particular countries. And so I thank very much Odd, Sarah, Thanks. and Andrew for um, doing this event, for having this partnership annually. And I hope it leaves you with more questions that you will be interested in finding out the answers to. Um, to next year. So <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Thanks for watching on the live stream and we'll see you then.